Welcome to the Mitchell Gallery's online exhibition of Jacob Lawrence, three series, Genesis, Toussaint, L'Overture, Hiroshima. I'm Lucinda Edinburgh, and I'm the art educator for the Mitchell Gallery. When this exhibition was planned more than two years ago, we had no idea that we would all be hunkered down in quarantine due to a pandemic. So, since the Mitchell Gallery at St. John's College has closed to visitors for the time being, we decided to present the exhibition online. And the images are rich with artistic and technical achievement, family influences, social, historical, and literary references. And so, we're presenting each of these series as a separate exhibition. The silkscreen prints in this exhibition, created in 1989 and 1990, illustrate and accompany the King James Version of the Book of Genesis. These eight studies are probably among the most prominent of Lawrence's late career works to be inspired by his early experiences. Jacob Armstead Lawrence was an important African-American painter, probably best known for his depictions of black culture in the early 20th century in his migration series. His bright, colorful genre paintings became associated with the late Harlem Renaissance of the 1930s and 1940s. Lawrence was born in 1917 in Atlantic City, New Jersey, but he moved around quite a bit as a child and lived in Pennsylvania and Virginia Bay before ultimately settling in Harlem in New York City with his mother at the age of 13. His talent was recognized at an early age and he began to take classes at the Utopia Neighborhood House, the 135th Street Library, which remained a constant influence and the Harlem Community Art Center where he studied under the sculptress Augusta Savage. She was known for mentoring a number of artists. He was then supported by the Federal Arts Project through the WPA uh, during the Depression. And then outside of his career as an artist, he had a prolific career as a teacher. He taught at the Art Students League, uh, Black Mountain College through the good graces of Joseph Albers, uh, the University of California, and then he spent his last 16 years teaching at the University of Washington in Seattle. Growing up in Harlem, Lawrence was baptized at the Abyssinian Baptist Church, a long-established African-American church founded in 1808. Although the congregation moved from Lower Manhattan to Harlem through the years, there was construction of different buildings, and the church that Lawrence grew up with and remains today is constructed in the Gothic and Tudor styles. And so you see these wonderful spires, uh, the windows, uh, the stone uh, architecture, building materials, arched doorways, all of the elements of these periods. The Abyssinian Baptist Church at one time was the largest Baptist congregation in the world, and it's a very large church at one time boasting 10,000 members. It was built with European stained glass windows and Italian marble furnishings, and Lawrence uses these as references in his Genesis works. Notice all the light that comes in from the top and from the back by altar, and then these windows darken, of course, at various times of the day. This is the beginning of the series. Number one, in the beginning all was void. Edward Epstein described Lawrence's works as flat interlocking shapes, which I think is just an excellent description because it suits these silkscreen stencils that Lawrence has had to make to create the works. He uses bright colors, he's inspired by realism, and you see this as we go through the prints. He includes the congregation. The perspective is taken from someone looking from the side of the pulpit rather than from the front view. From the front view, things would be much flatter. From the side, he can see the movement of the preacher. 
a part of the congregation is seen on the right. Uh, the churchgoers are dressed in their finest with uh, coats and ties for the men, women in dresses wearing jewelry. Throughout the series, they're always sitting, not always in the same arrangement, but they are always sitting. And perhaps this reflects their willingness to be receptive to the divine word. There are many details in all of these works, and if you notice, as we look through the images, you'll see a flower in a stand on the right of the image, and flowers are certainly a part of church decor, but this flower changes throughout each of the images. If you look closely to the right and to the top of the flower, there's a box, and it's got a hammer and something that maybe looks like a drill, suggesting creation. And Lawrence had a great interest in tools, and I find it really interesting that he's included man-made tools to, to indicate you know, the building of creation and brings a much more human side to the story of creation. The Gothic windows in the back are black, uh, giving this sense of void. This is the only image that has darkened windows. And notice the stance for the preacher in each work as well. They're always bold, they're passionate. Number two, God brought forth the firmament and the waters. Based on his own memory of the Sunday sermons of the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Sr., Lawrence's Genesis creation series is, is very personal. It's a very personal interpretation. The Reverend Powell was a dynamic and charismatic figure, and he also had an imposing physical presence uh, with a height of six feet three. And for Powell, emotionalism was the heart of the religious experience. He was quoted as saying that, that it, it's electric, this current in the organized Christian church. Confine it to batteries and this wild and frightful something could run our trains, drive our automobiles, and bring New York and South Africa whispering distance of each other. I had to reflect on that. Those are rousing statements and I can imagine this booming voice echoing with all this resonance in this large church and how the passion given out in the expression of his voice would certainly cause the congregation to listen and for a young child to be in complete awe. Notice how in this image the congregation is looking up and to the right, and so in the windows you see the swirl of water and the action that's with it. The preacher who's dressed in cold appears to be making this impassioned plea, and notice the boldness of his stance. He's got one leg sticking out and sort of reaching forward, and the rays of light are shining on him as if Perhaps he was ordained to witness this moment in creation, that maybe he's in rapture. The pulpit is not depicted here, and I think this would allow more freedom of movement you know, for the preacher. The toolbox that we saw earlier that was by the flower is now up by that window on the right, and the flower in the long vase has now opened up. In the previous image, the bud was tightly closed. Number three, and God said, let the earth bring forth the grass, fruits, and herbs. In this image, the preacher is facing the window and the viewer can see the trees now created. You also see a cloud there in the background. The flooring is this turquoise, although up by the preacher it's much darker. The pulpit is in back of him, in front of us, and you can see that his attitude has changed with his arms. The composition is interesting too because the congregation wraps around on the side in kind of a semicircle and reflects the shape created by his uplifted arm. 
The mastery of Lawrence's compositions really provides perspective with the preacher in the foreground, the part of the congregation in the middle ground, and then the background with the windows. The toolbox remains, although it's in a different orientation, but on the right side, and the flower in the vase there in the front hugs the top of the vase rim. We will see that the colors around the preacher and his gowns change with each scene. I wanted to spend a few minutes on the silkscreen process because it's a multi-step process that allows experimentation with techniques that perhaps painting does not. Lawrence began printmaking following his first retrospective in 1960, and this was at the Brooklyn Museum. He was already an established painter and was attracted to the idea of being able to reach a wider audience with prints. And this is not a new idea. Durer, Rembrandt, Chagall, Picasso, Rubens, many artists saw the virtue of the accessibility of the print, but also printmaking was well suited to Lawrence's bold geometric graphics. And then he could experiment with the media and the techniques as he chose and work some of his earlier subjects. The silk screen is created by taking what was originally a fine mesh silk and attaching it to a wooden frame. And then a stencil is cut out out of paper or other some sort of fine, strong material, uh, which can also be blocked out with a photographic emulsion. And then the ink is applied at one end of the frame, and the ink is dragged across the frame using a squeegee, which is the same size of the frame. And the ink goes through the pores of the fabric. They're not blocked. You can see in this slide the silkscreen frame with the printer as hands on the squeegee at the end. Many colors can be used. Uh, this one looks like it's only red, but a different screen has to be made for each color. Lawrence used between 17 and 22 screens for his work, so that's certainly ambitious. And they have to line up because it's put down one color at a time. Number four, and God created the day and the night, and God put stars in the sky. The same four Gothic windows remain in the background, and the turquoise color flooring remains as it was in the previous image, but now the congregation has shifted to the left side, and the preacher has shifted to the right. The spread of stars flows through the background in the windows, the toolbox is now up on the left corner under the window. And it makes me think when a carpenter is working, they move their toolbox around as they're creating. And I wonder if this is some allusion to that. What had been a flower in a vase is now just greenery that you see there on the right. And the placement of what is probably the Bible has changed from being in the preacher's left hand and is now seen on the pulpit with his hand on it. And with the arch of his back and the size of the book and his hand on the book emphasizes the apex of the moment. The movement of the congregation, the preacher, and the various penalties keep this narrative moving and dramatic. Number five, and God created all the fowls of the air and fishes of the seas. This is a particularly dramatic scene with the preacher having his left arm wrapped around the pulpit, bracing himself, and his right hand pointing up. It's a very strong movement. He is front and center in the composition. He's furthermost at the front. And this red robe adds to the emphasis on this miracle of creation that's taking place. The other colors used in this print are, seem much more subtle due to the size and bold color of the preacher. And also 
the cooler colors used and not the strong golds and oranges that we've seen in previous prints. You can see the congregation looking up and see all the floating birds in the window in the background. The toolbox remains under that first window, but the arrangement of tools is different as are the colors. And again, when a work is in progress, the toolbox moves around. I wanted to mention also that the text that's written to the left of each of the images is in Jacob Lawrence's handwriting, so it's very distinctive. Lawrence wrote, I was baptized in the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem in about 1932. There I attended church, I attended Sunday school, and I remember the ministers giving very passionate sermons pertaining to the creation. This was over 50 years ago, and you know, these things stay with you even though you don't realize what an impact these experiences are making on you at the time. So it's really a lovely reflection on thinking about his childhood and the culture in which he was raised and how that's come to fruition in his artwork at a later time. Number six, and God created all the beasts of the earth. In this narrative, all the action leans toward the right. Everything is going off the page. The Bible remains on the pulpit behind the preacher. The angles of the pews separate the congregation, and even the movement of the animals is all going off to the right, even if their heads are moved to the left. So this gives the work a real sense of motion and activity. The congregation now surrounds the preacher, whereas in the other prints they most often have been on one side of him or the other of the altar. It's interesting to me, too, that the Bible is almost sort of cast aside to take in this new moment of, of the creation process. And the emotional, outstretched, reaching hands of the minister is very different than the beseeching posture in the first image where there was all void. The various animals seen here, horses, rams, tigers, there's even an elephant, are all stretched to the right even if their heads are to the left. And the toolbox is now moved to the second window and the flower vase has disappeared completely, which I find interesting. This is the only print that doesn't have the flower vase. Maybe the beasts ate them. <laughs> Ideas of iconography with tools and flowers are not unlike the decorations included in the marginalia of early manuscripts, and so all of these things have symbolism in one way or another. Number seven, and God created man and woman. The arrangement of the congregation continues to shift, and now there's a semicircle with some of the congregants looking at the preacher and others looking out at the window. And you can see them holding a Bible or a hymnal, which has been included in other images, but these seem more prominent. And the window is bright now, with trees in each window and Adam depicted in the second window from the left, and Eve shown slightly smaller in the third window. They're depicted in white, and so you have to look there in the trees. This is actually, though, the first time we've seen a clear definition of the preacher's face. He's bald on top and holding his arms out in praise. Again, the toolbox is moved, and this time it's into the aisle, and this is my own interpretation, sort of wondering if this is the indication that God's beginning to wrap things up here, that creation is coming to a conclusion. Uh, the tools themselves are not seen, but everything is very neatly arranged. And now the flower vase has a flower in it in full bloom. Number eight, and creation was done and all was well. The colors used in this part of the narrative are much cooler than the previous images with lots of greens as opposed to the golds and reds seen in earlier parts of the story. There's a more settled attitude, I think. The congregation is now on the left as if they're facing the altar and the preacher's arms are stretched to indicate that perhaps one should now 
behold what has evolved and been created. The windows have the full complements of trees and fruits, blue skies. The toolbox, again, for so much that I've talked about, remains by the pew at the first window, but the windows have now come further back and they recede in the background of the composition. There are many interesting details about Jacob Lawrence's life with his prominent career as an artist and a teacher. His colorful works focus on justice, equality, and the African-American perspective drawn from his own family heritage, his upbringing, particularly in Harlem, world history, literature, and social change. Although he attended the Abyssinian Baptist Church as a boy and remained fundamentally spiritual throughout his life, The Eight Studies was the only work that he made based upon a story from the Bible. Lawrence died on June 9th, the year 2000, in Seattle, Washington, and I'm reflecting on this as I'm recording this on the day of his birthday, September 7th. At the age of 82, he passed with a full recognition of his accomplishments and high praise for his work through numerous exhibitions, awards, and honorary doctorates. His works are represented in all of the major museums, including the Chicago Art Institute, the National Gallery of Art, the Phillips Collection, Museum of Modern Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Library of Congress, and many other institutions. So we are particularly pleased to have this section Bishon, albeit online, uh, for you to see. We also thank Jeff Landau from Landau Traveling Exhibitions for allowing us to show the works online, and to Alatash Kabedi, the collector. Thank you for taking the time to listen in on this lecture. We hope it provides some insights into the work of Jacob Lawrence. We will present another series to Sant Lovatur in October. So please check out our website for a full exhibition schedule with events of live streamed interviews, um, book clubs, family projects, music, and many other things. Thank you, be safe, and be well.